From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. Signal adds quantum resistant encryption. Microsoft has a double tough week with GitHub and Xbox and Cisco buys Splunk for $28 billion in cash. These are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have been bringing to you on this week's cybersecurity headlines. And now we get a chance for some insight, some opinion, and most certainly some expertise on these stories and more from our returning guest, Sean Bowen, the CISO at World Connect Corporation, making his fifth appearance. Sean, how does it feel uh, to be a fi in the Five Timers Club? Thank you. Uh, this is um, something I look forward to. I, I hope that I can get on the show every week, but apparently you guys have to like come up with new hosts every once in a while. People don't want to listen to me. So I'm excited <laughs> to do five here. And I think this would be 14 for the collective series. And then in, yeah. in, uh, and in two weeks, I'm showing up again. <laughs> well, yeah, for that 15th, you either get a choice of uh, a key yeah. to the season series executive washroom, a uh, handy okay. coffee mug. Uh, you actually get this one. It's a used one, but you can appreciate it. Or maybe a commemorative USB, a USB drive that David got with a cracked version of Photoshop. So yeah, that's uh, any of those, any of those are great. Photoshop uh, Sean, like seven, you, right? Yeah, oh no, it's yeah, it's like CS2 or something like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably like a original Mac. Uh Sean, you also have uh, uh you're celebrating something today, right? I, I am. Uh so thanks. It's uh, my fifth anniversary. So happy anniversary, Danae. Thank you for putting up with me all these years. We love it. And the other thing we're celebrating today is our sponsor, Hyperproof. It's not just a GRC platform. It's a get work done platform. All the celebrations now done. We're going to invite you to join us on YouTube live to go to CISOseries.com. You can hit that events drop down. Look for the cybersecurity headlines. Week in review image. It is the third one down. You can also subscribe to CISO series on YouTube and you'll know when we go live. And if you're watching us live, contribute with your comments in our chat. We've already got James Driscoll asking questions. We got Kevin Farrell showing up there. We've got all sorts of people checking it out. So we want you to join in on that every single week. We've got about 20 minutes though. I'm not going to wait for everybody to pile in the chat room. We've got about 20 minutes. So let's get into the news. First one here, one of the big stories of the week, DHS Council seeks to simplify cyber incident reporting rules. On Tuesday, the Department of Homeland Security's, or DHS as known the biz, Cyber Incident Reporting Council delivered a 100-page report that recommends revamping cyber incident reporting requirements imposed upon U.S. critical infrastructure operators. The report found that critical infrastructure entities face a dizzying 45 active reporting requirements from 22 different federal agencies with an additional five under consideration. Harmonizing these requirements is expected to help both the private sector and federal government better understand the threat landscape while helping them prioritize their efforts. Uh, this seems like it's gonna be a multi-year initiative. Sean, uh, this touches on uh, on your day-to-day. -day. What are your thoughts? Yeah, this is uh, something close. I think it's, uh, we got a lot, long way to go on this. Uh, I've been doing a lot of research recently in the community. We've talked a lot about a uh, gap for security. So I've been looking at the history of that and, and how it came about after uh, the market crash in the 20s and the Securities Act in the 30s. And then, you know, we had uh, SOX in 2000, right? So it's taken a lot of years for the financial sector, which is math and math really hasn't changed too much unless you're doing that common core stuff. Um, <laughs> but it hasn't really changed much. And we've taken this many years to kind of get a, a formalized way to do work so that CFOs can report, um, and, and we have a lot of problems in the security space where we have issues coming out. We have the recent SEC rules. Uh, we have what's going on with Tim at SolarWinds and in the Wells Notice. And, and we need to have this. Um, uh, we need to have better reporting requirements, consistent reporting requirements. We need um, a, a simplified approach for what we're going to do because our area is changing consistently. And so we need to have that framework. Uh, and it's going to come through regulation. Uh, the CISOs as, as a collective community will not be able to report consistently and 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 have that support for, uh, backing from our executive teams until we get some of this regulation. So I think this is a good start, but uh, we need a lot. We need about 100 years worth of work in the next year, year and a half to, to get us to where we need to be, I think. Yeah, and we'll be covering uh, as we get kind of updates from, you know, uh, policy changes rolling out and stuff like that through cybersecurity headlines. So make sure you stay tuned for that, because I am definitely interested to see how this develops uh, over the next year or two. 
Uh, next up here, Signal adds quantum resistant encryption. The encrypted messaging service announced it has upgraded its key agreement protocol to post-quantum extended Diffie-Hellman. I don't need to tell you, that's PQXDH. This uses both its previously utilized protocol, X3DH, and the NIST-approved post-quantum key encapsulation mechanism, Crystal's Kyber. Signal said it would not entirely replace its existing elliptic curve cryptography foundations, but said it believes Crystal's Kyber is a solid foundation for the future. So they're kind of rolling this into their existing stuff, not a wholesale replacement. Sean Signal has always been open about its end-to-end -end encryption. It's one of the big draws of the app and the service, and it seems to have taken a big leap forward with PQXDH. I'm curious what's your take on this. You've said so many letters, and James Driscoll posted something about Crystal's <laughs> Kyber. I'm looking it up on the internet, and, the, and um, yeah, there's going to be flaws. We're going to have um, several different issues uh, as we move forward. That's just the nature of the business. I mean, we still have flaws from the '90s show up in some of our protocols um, that we, you know that we detect years later. Um, but it's the right step. And, and one thing I, I do really appreciate about Signal is its transparency. Um, we, we've in the last couple of years, we've talked a lot about transparency with S bombs and and um, being you know our supply chain transparency. And this type of transparency is what we need to have uh, through all of our products. So, yeah. And what's what's interesting? This um, yeah, James Driscoll was talking about that there were some flaws discovered in Chris, uh, Crystal's Kyber and. What, what this signals, uh, no pun intended, from Signal is that, you know, this, they're, they're getting prepared for a, you know, a post-quantum uh, encryption world, but that this isn't in any way. This is, this is the first step that shows that they're thinking about it, that they, see, that they see that's not just a hypothetical, that this is coming down the road, um, and that they're going to continue to keep iterating on this because uh, that's kind of the, their priority for for all their stuff there. So yeah. uh, I, again, I, uh, I, I'm i sure at some point on cybersecurity headlines, we'll be reporting uh, on, uh, hey, first uh, uh, encryption crack from a quantum computer. Uh, we'll see if that's uh, uh, yeah, yeah. One, one or five years down the road, but it's inevitable, right? I agree. It's it's definitely coming. I think uh, David the Hammer uh, might be quantum, quantum breaking you if you don't fix your mic. <laughs> uh, so, so there's a whole chat going on for that. But yeah, it, it's the world's evolving. We got to follow it. All right. Uh, and uh, next up here, just let me get here. Sorry, my chat here. Next up here, Cisco buys Splunk for $28 billion in cash. The $28 billion purchase is intended to boost its software business and reduce its reliance on its networking hardware business while taking on new security issues presented by AI technology, all of the good buzzwords. Cisco already had a partnership with Splunk and actually sought to purchase it last year at a deal that at that time fell through. The deal is scheduled to be completed at the end of the third quarter of 2024. However, according to Reuters, rumblings of antitrust scrutiny have already started. That is the order of the day for all big transactions like this. Sean, $28 billion, big number, even for a company the size of Cisco. I'm curious, what do you make of this? Well, I think uh, Cisco probably has a green room chat that they need to check. Um, <laughs> But uh, no, I think 28 billion is interesting. I do appreciate the joke of someone saying that, you know, Cisco couldn't afford the license fee. So they uh, went ahead and bought them, uh, which is, which is, you know, some of us in security feel that pain. Um, but it's, it's, I think it's a good play. I think you're going to start to see more of it. If you follow some of the investments in the, in the security spaces is where we're going because um, we, uh, the workforce, um, Def deficits that we have requires us to have more simplified, you know, programs where you go in and you buy everything all at once, you know, CrowdStrike or Microsoft, maybe a Palo Alto. Um, and, and you need to kind of get that entire suite. So we're not training our teams on 20 different tools. And so um, not saying that that's always the best thing, but uh, I think that's something that we need to um, you know, be available for enough organizations. Obviously, the highly sophisticated organizations, you can take on multiple different tools because you have a much uh, deeper development program. But we're going to see Cisco do this. We're going to, you know, you see the in the news recently, uh, Palo Alto and Cisco are fighting over Talon. Um, it's just expanding their security stack so that they can offer one complete ecosystem to a customer, which is enticing to a lot of CISOs. All right, before I move on, uh, just want to say uh, 
sorry about the mic issues. They should be now fixed uh, and uh, everything sounded good. <laughs> Next up here, UK and California put new laws out there for cyber safety. A busy week for lawmakers with the British government's controversial online safety bill, which does not include in the final draft a ban on end to end encryption, something tech companies opposed, a push to use accredited safety technology that does not yet exist, and the requirement for online companies like Meta, Google, and TikTok to not only take down illegal material, but to prevent it from being posted in the first place or face big fines GDPR style. In California, the legislator passed the Delete Act, which requires the California Privacy Protection Agency to create a website where citizens can see registered data brokers in the state and delete personal data and prohibiting brokers from selling or sharing any newly collected information. Kind of provides a central point to do this for all data brokers. Previously, you'd had to go one by one. So, Sean, lots to unpack here. Where What stands out to you amongst these two big pieces of legislation? Yeah, I think similar to as I was mentioning the DHS piece, we 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 need this regulation to kind of frame uh, the expectations of our organizations um, so that they're clearly out there. I think one thing that's missing, even we talk about GDPR and, and um, you know, both of these recent um, proposed rules is we need to define the how on doing stuff. And I think a lot of it, we, we, they've jumped directly to the enforcement component of it and it's left a kind of squishy gray area, which, is a good thing. And sometimes because you can argue in and out of that gray area on what shade it is, but that's also a bad area, bad thing because um, when, when the prosecution wants to come in, they kind of can drive a bus through that as well. And so um, I'm becoming more and more of a fan of a little bit more rigidity in some of the spaces. I mean, that's not everything. I don't want to stifle innovation and, and, and add unnecessary costs to companies, especially small, medium businesses. Um, but we need to have more clear defined how, not just what. Um, and I think that's what's missing in a lot of the legislation. But I think these are in the, in the right space and where we need to be going. All right. Well, before we move on, we want to spend a few moments and hear a word from our sponsor, Hyperproof. Is your company scaling? Do you need to quickly add more compliance frameworks but don't know where to start? Hyperproof has you covered. Hyperproof is a risk and compliance management platform that can help you manage compliance at scale. With Hyperproof, you can quickly add new frameworks, crosswalk controls between frameworks, view your risk posture, and manage your risks all in one place. Visit hyperproof.io to get started today. Next up here, Microsoft has a double tough week with GitHub and Xbox. A lot of news here, so stick with us. First, researchers at Wiz revealed that Microsoft AI researchers exposed sensitive data in a storage bucket of AI training data on GitHub. The researchers intended to share image recognition models. However, misconfigured permissions granted access to 38 terabytes of data. And this included things like private keys, passwords, and over 30,000 internal Teams messages. Then, late Monday evening, what some are describing as the biggest leak in Xbox history, uh, apparently it stemmed from Microsoft's dealings with the FTC related to the Activision Blizzard acquisition, which seems set to close now, by the way. In this case, Microsoft appears to have also accidentally uploaded a series of highly sensitive PDFs and slides that revealed Microsoft's plans for Xbox, and this included things like new game consoles, Game Pass fees, expected subscriber growth rates, and a list of upcoming games, and also Ooh. acquisition details about potentially buying Nintendo. On Tuesday, the FTC confirmed that Microsoft was responsible for the errant file download or the file upload, uh, quoting the vaunted Shaggy defense. So, Sean, not looking to pick on Microsoft directly, but both of these situations point to accidental release of confidential information. Humans make mistakes, of course, but in your work, do you see weaknesses in the systems that make these expensive mistakes just too easy? Is this a systemic issue or is this a you click the wrong button kind of thing? Yeah, it, it's it's a combination. I think it's a um, it, it's both. I think it's both, uh, frankly. And and you know, Microsoft's it's easy to pick on Microsoft because it's one company and we can kind pick on. But you think of the breadth breadth of what they offer. Um, they're you know they're multiple different companies and and um, you know that doesn't excuse them from these types of problems. But it's it's um, it makes it easier to target them. The, the problems that you see in both these cases were definitely either human error in the sense of either they don't know what they're doing or they weren't thinking through the process. Um, I'm a big fan of Checklist Manifesto, the book, um, talking about going through checklists and 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 some things just require checklists and, and mm -hmm. people need to follow them. 
Um, and that means literally pull out the checkbook. Doesn't matter how smart you think you are, pull out the checklist and, uh, and go through that checklist and, and, um, and it re reduces some of this. Now it's interesting because they uploaded it to an external website. I don't know if they would have, how they would execute a checklist on that. I think the GitHub one, they could have done a little bit better uh, checklist or two person verification uh, around sensitive data. I think the, the sprawl that we have of data in the world, just in general, and people not have an association with it. When we talk about risk, you know, humans can associate physical harm very easily. Like if you see your leg, uh, you know, being, you do, being dismembered, you can, that's very easy. You go, Oh, that's very clear. That's a risk. Um, but data movement and, and it stuff, we don't really understand it. You know, human wise, we don't really understand the pain of it until you've gone through lost data of your, you know, compromised identities or a breach where you're working full time, uh, recovering stuff like that. Like, until you've lived through it, people aren't able to really comprehend. And I think we're going to continue making mistakes like this. Uh, and, and it doesn't, honestly, it doesn't matter how many checks we put in place. Um, there's, there's the rushing and, and ex accelerating through things that people are always going to do that. We just need to figure out a way to slow that down be more methodical. Um, and that's just a human thing. And, and in our world, we, we expect things yesterday with almost everything. So it's hard to sit down and just think and, and that be a good day, a good day of just, I spent the day thinking, right? So yeah, <laughs> need definitely need more of those, uh, uh, going forward. Uh, next up here, ransomware hits trucking software provider, New Jersey based Orbcom disclosed last Friday, a ransomware attack that occurred on September 6th impacted their fleet manager platform and BT product line. Orbcom provides, among many other things, electric electronic logging device systems that are required by the U.S. Department of Transportation to monitor drivers' driving time. The disruption has forced drivers to return to paper logbooks. At Friday's announcement, the company would not say which ransomware group was behind the incident or whether they paid a ransom. So, Sean, this becomes uh, part of our ongoing conversation about critical infrastructure and supply chain. Seems like we have one of these every single week. Just as with hospitals, you know, sending something uh, like trucking, a just-in-time process back to paper can cause chaos or at least cascading delays. Is there any way out of, you know, what could become a massive vulnerability? Yeah, this one's... Uh... I ponder regularly, and as I, I expect, uh, I suspect a lot of other security professionals do, is how much of this is coordinated um, or deliberate, like, hey, this is a valued uh, organization, we can disrupt a lot of things, or if it's just uh, they happened upon a company and they just now, they, hey, we're going to ransomware them and they happen to make the news. And so obviously, if this is a directed um, attack, this is a very good one to kind of disrupt a lot of uh, the nation's movement and and so it's just one of those things where um it's scary and in reality the companies need to think through resiliency like what will you do if this is out what's your backup plan or how quickly can you resume operations in the normal way and, and you need to build that out and go through these scenarios of what if everything went away how how quickly can you rebuild that environment um or or how can how quickly can you move to a, a backup site or something along those lines? And, and I don't think we're thinking through that yet. This kind of goes back to some of the regulation pieces. I don't think we have enough uh, enforcement of people to think through that operations process. Um, and, and then, but ultimately, it comes down to a risk. If we think it's not going to happen um, too often, we're going to take that risk, right? And so that's the balance we got to try to figure out is is how do we manage the likeliness of this happening over a period of time when we can't quite calculate it, like we can calculate weather patterns pretty, pretty quickly. And we know, we know cruises are reduced rate in August, September, because that's hurricane season. We, we don't know when the reduced ransomware season is. So, uh, <laughs> Not yet. Maybe we'll there's an actuarial table somewhere yeah. that, that has the, the secret combo, but yeah, yeah. Uh, it is, it is remarkable. Uh, I, I mean, I, certainly since the colonial pipeline stuff or this, the, you know, the solar winds attacks that, you know, when we're talking about any kind of supply chain, the, the points of fragility that are out there that you don't think about something like yeah. tracking time or something like that. And the, the impacts that could have um, it, it's, you know, even, even understanding the risks, it is uh, you know, overall, maybe to an organization, you know, it, it is tough to, to, to enumerate all the different ways that they could find vulnerabilities like that. But uh, you know, there's more eyes on it now than ever. And like you said, probably some more regulation coming that way as well. So uh, uh, hopefully, uh, see see less of this kind of stuff but definitely a, an interesting story from this week for sure yeah and at an increased cost right yeah yeah oh yes yes 
All right, next here, uh, and our last story for today, Google's Bard chatbot can now find answers in your mail or on your drive. Google's Bard AI chatbot can now find and summarize the content of an email or even highlight the most important points of a document you have stored and drived. As an opt-in feature, Google emphasizes that it will not use the data it finds to train Bard. Users can initiate a search from within Gmail using the app mail or check my email uh, prompt. It'll also connect with Maps, YouTube, and Google Flights by default. So, Sean, this may be good news for anyone who has spent time waiting through lists of emails, trying to find that message without the right uh, you know, keyword search. I I'm curious, uh, what kind of impact do you see this having? It's a, it's a big capability, you know, like emails kind of you know, the, the, the keys to a lot of uh, organizations. Uh, you know, how big of a deal is this? Yeah, well, I think uh, you should insert my um, shocked emoji right here. Uh, <laughs> Google, the company that made its money off of people's data, is now putting AI in people's data. Oh, oh there's a novel idea. Um, <laughs> and then we and then we come off of the heels of talking about uh, you know breaches in the supply chain. So obviously, you know, I'm a, I'm a, so I'm personally a fan of the AI uh, world. Obviously. A lot of people are taking it a little lazy. They just kind of input, take whatever the output is and paste it on and claim that that's their their email that they wrote and they didn't proofread it. So there needs to be some work on there. Um, but I'm hoping that the supply chain piece of this is properly protected because now we've just exposed a ton of personal data. And, and if we're touching this into corporate world, um, you know, hopefully there's some seg segmentation on the Google side of of who's what's connecting to where so you can do things. And, and but Ultimately, I'm a fan of this. Uh, we, you know, we're going to see, I think, Microsoft's uh, Windows 11 23H2 is going to have some AI built into the operating system uh, in the next month or two. And so we're going to see this naturally, that things are going to start to come to our local uh, systems. And, and that's just that's the way we're going. We're going we're, we're gonna to have to do this, and it's going to hopefully make us all better as long as we learn what to use, what we're using. Yeah. And in terms of, you know, that that risk versus benefit conversation. Right. I mean, you're you know, I, I'm sure a lot of organizations are saying, listen, th this could you know, if I'm if I'm doing less like horrific search through terrible email threads and I can you know derive insights just from a single text prompt like that, like that's th like on that scale of where we're looking at risk. That's that's a big, you know, uh, that's that's a big weight on one side yeah. for sure. Well, I just got back from two weeks of vacation. I'd love to just <laughs> yeah, yeah. ask it. What do I actually have to read? Yeah, uh, seriously. So. Yeah. And, and then you could I, I mean, there's all sorts of you know, ways you could plug that in, yeah. uh, you know, I'm, and I'm sure Google is looking to monetize all of that. Uh, all right. Well, before we get out of here, we got to uh, give a thank you to everybody that was going on in our chat. We had some lively discussion going on here. Uh, Diana Moy just said, just download the checklist manifesto. Thanks for the recommendation. Uh, yeah. So uh, Sean, thank you so much for that. Uh, and we have uh, uh, someone, a, a LinkedIn user saying, I'm still marveling at Microsoft and Nintendo. The details of that, if you're into that world are, uh, are super spicy. Yeah. Uh, it, it is quite excellent. And yes, uh, no, Velvet Jacket is for 30 times on a CISO series podcast. So, Sean, you're halfway yeah. there. Halfway there. Uh, you're halfway there. Uh, so and then you uh, but at 20, you get a, a picture on our wall for uh, okay. podcast guest of the year. So that I'll works. autograph it, too. Yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, yes, trust me, as an Xbox fan, I would love to see an Xbox DS. So oh, whatever that collaboration needs to be, <laughs> they need to get on it. That's called a Steam Deck and ROMs. Sean. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sean. Well, before we get out of here, is there any story that was a thumbs up or an eye roller for you? Something that you just reacted strongly to? For me, it's it's the uh, movement, the regulation. I think um, I'm I'm feeling for for Tim at Solar Winds. I think that you know the I I don't think any CISO out there, or any security professional, wants to be in his seat. And I'm not talking about from a post breach. I think we've all kind of dealt with uh, some level of breach or not, but I, I'm talking about the, the follow on actions. And, and Tim has been championing the CISO community as a whole and, and standing up for us in through this process. And I really appreciate what Tim's been doing. Um, and uh, we just need to get some more of this regulation uh, defined for all of us in, in the community so that we could, we, we won't like it, whatever it comes out, we won't like it, but it'll be better than not having anything. All right. Well, Sean, uh, before you get out of here, where can people find you online? And are you hiring? Uh, LinkedIn. I do have to make a post. Uh, last week I was speaking at a conference. I need to make a post. Uh, it was a really good conference, met with a lot of good people. So uh, that'll be coming up soon. And I am hiring. 
we have a position in our GRC team uh, working for Dustin and, and uh, I'll be hiring for a, a director of security engineering. Excellent. Well, Sean Bone, the CISO at World Connect Corporation. Thank you so much for being on uh, the fifth time. Uh, uh, just keeps getting better and better. We will definitely have to have you on uh, a, a ton more. I'm going to at least say, 15. I need the velvet least, jacket. You got to get that jacket. Yeah. We're going to give it to you in the dead of summer, though, and you have yeah. to wear it on that. I, I would wear it proudly. <laughs> I wore the fleece in Miami in July. So this is true. You're, you're willing to suffer for the team. So we appreciate yeah. it. Uh, thanks also to our sponsor, Hyperproof. It's not just a GRC platform. It's a get work done platform. Also, thanks to all of our commenters today. We can't always get everything up on the screen, but we truly appreciate you being here. James Driscoll, uh, Edwin Covert, uh, anonymous LinkedIn user, uh, Diana Moy, everybody that's on there. Could be a multiple anonymous LinkedIn Kevin users. Farrell in there. Whatever degree of anonymity you have, thank you so much. Truly appreciate it. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Week in Review show. And also next Friday, be sure to check uh, to join us for Super Cyber Friday, where the topic will be hacking bosses, an hour of critical thinking about how to manage conflict and engage with higher ups to advance your career. Check out CISOseries.com and the events tab to register. And in the meantime, of course, you can get your daily news fixed through cybersecurity headlines every single day. Give us about six minutes. We'll get you all caught up. Until the next time we meet, I'm Rich Straffolino reminding you to have a super sparkly day. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines. Thank you.